Imagine that you grew up as a Gentile knowing that you've got all these foreign gods. Now, we call them foreign gods. To them, they were known gods. Uh, you know, and some of those gods were worshipped in very strange ways. Some of those gods demanded the blood of the firstborn. Some of those gods demanded, uh, you know, sexual intercourse as a way of worship wherein you had to offer up your husband or your wife or your daughter for people of different classes to go to the temples and worship these gods uh, in through, through sexual orgies and those kind of things. I mean, what a way to live. Here God looks at these people that are in these terrible situation god does have knowledge of that but he has a solution all these people already know that it is not good for them they are looking for good news they have enough bad news they already know the bad news but they don't know the answer they don't know how to be free imagine the turmoil you had to live in knowing that at a certain age you have to give or sacrifice your child or if you and your wife has got children you would know that the firstborn is going to be offered and sacrificed be put in the fire the baby is going to be burnt to death I mean that is not imagine the turmoil you go through when you live in a world like that here, the gospel comes where it is said, you don't have to sacrifice your child. You don't have to offer up. We find a God that comes and says, I am so much willing to protect your life that I am willing to lay down my life to give you life. My dream was to preserve your life, not take your life. My dream is to serve you with goodness, to give you an eternal abode. I am not in need of servants. I have come to serve. I am not here to take your life, but to give your life. The life that I want to take is the life of um, stress, the life of worries. I want to take that away from you, and I want to give you life. So what would the news be that all of mankind needs? The news that all of mankind needs is the good news of a Messiah that comes to save us, where we hear that what oppresses us is taken away by the actions of a loving God. That is what people need to hear. And here Paul comes and he says that I have come to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. So the mouth of the apostle was not the mouth of how bad the Caesar is or what the next negative thing is that was done by, um, by some, some bad people. We find that Paul did men mention negative things in saying to people, listen, watch out for this person or that person because he persecutes you and, and just make sure that when you get into a certain town, you know, like Alexander the coppersmith or this person or that person, be careful for them because they brought difficulty to me. So there was also warnings that was given out. But we found that Paul didn't think that it was necessary for the church to know negative things in order for them to be good Christians. I have been taught from Bible school times, even until now, regularly, we f I see people saying that we as the church need to be informed about what is bad so that we can be good Christians and bring a change. It sounds noble, but how doable is that? Isn't it like this? Doesn't matter what the sickness is, if we, if we had a certain pill, that could solve all diseases. You don't have to have knowledge of all the bad diseases. You would just know the answer. That's all you need to know. By flooding yourself with things, and especially the lie, that you have to be informed about all the negative things as well in order to be a successful Christian and to be involved, to be an answer, if you believe that, you will stress yourself out. You will put yourself in unnecessary stress. I just practical example. 
uh, somebody, and I mean people send videos to me on a daily basis, but somebody sent me a video of a shooting that took place in South Africa in Pretoria. Two young people were driving in a car on the freeway in the middle of the day. You can see it looks like noon. And somebody came next to them with AK-47 machine guns, started to just shoot at them. Nobody got hit, thank God. They stopped the car. The young youngsters ran away. The people came in and took the handbag. Now, I take that they maybe were drawing some money from the ATM and now these people was an armed robbery and so forth. But you look at all of that and you think of these are students. They are young people. And they robbed like that by four or five men with machine guns and stuff. You feel immediately in your heart. It's like an anger that rises in your heart. It's like an injustice that comes to you. Your mind immediately starts to reason. You start to think, uh, you know, this is not right. That is not right. You know, the government is the government. And you immediately in a stress situation there. Now, those things happen. And you might even be on the road and witness something like that. And yes, there is uh, an adrenaline release. Yes, there is things that take place. But how do we handle that as Christians? I spoke to my son about it. He lives there. It's in the area where he lives in, in, in the north, in Pretoria. And he said to me, Dad, what do you do in a situation like that? I said, man, I don't even know. I don't know. These kids ran away. It was good for them. Others might have been shot when they ran away. We don't know what, what will take place. So what would do we do in that situation? And this is what, I th what is an answer to me. I believe, as what the Jesus said to the people, Listen, the, don't think of what you will say when you are brought in front of the courts because in that hour, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. There are so many things in this world that we want to sort out now and the reason why what we want to sort it out now is because naturally it's normal for us to secure our own lives and protect our lives about future threats. And I'm not saying one cannot do that. But when we get to a place where we don't know what we're going to do, we don't know, are they going to bring in another lockdown? Are they going to take out all our, all the, are we going to become communists? What is going to take place? We don't know. When we get that news all the time, I think the answer to any news where you want to try and prepare on what to say and what to do is always, listen, in that hour, God will tell you what to say and what to do. What God is saying, listen, even there, in that situation, there is life that I will give you. And that is not by works, it's not by law, it's not by what you do, it is by the very nature of God. I've said this many times and it is something that has helped me in my life in, in, in tremendously. I remember that there was a time in my life when I was very stressed out about finances. The first 10 years of my marriage, I, was, I would say I, there were times, it was becoming less, um, but at about nine, ten years into my marriage, I was one day stressing about money again. I wasn't stressing every day, but you would stress certain times. And I was stressing again, and I think I was maybe a bit grumpy there at home and, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting some pressure on Eliana. Listen, we need to look at how we spend our money, this, that, whatever. Just a normal guy. <laughs> and uh, Eliana said to me, listen, I want to tell you something. God has provided for you in your unbelief for 10 years. I'm witnessing. I'm a witness of that. You didn't live in faith. You lived in fear. And God provided for you in your unbelief. When are you going to believe that God is going to care for you? And then she also added in, why would he not provide this time? And I look back. It was not because of my great faith. It was not because of all my positive confession. She was right. I was living in unbelief. I was living in fear. Yet God provided. The only thing that the fear did was, it was just putting pressure on the relationship. It was just uh, putting pressure in the sense of unnecessary arguments about things. 
I must say it brought the great change, just that logical understanding. This is as if I saw the faithfulness of God even in the midst of my unfaithfulness as pertaining to faith and trust in him. He provides almost like uh, Jesus speaking to the disciples. Look at the previous times when, and I'm using my own words, when you didn't have faith and I provided bread. Why now do you think that I wouldn't? provide. I changed water into wine. I did feed the 5,000. I did care. Why, why are you stressed out now? Now there's a storm. Why are you living in fear? I said, let's go to the other side. So what are we going to do? We're going to go to the other side. And even in the time when they lived in continual unbelief and they were fearing and they were saying, don't you care that we perish? Jesus still calmed the storm for them, even in that situation. I believe he would have calmed the storm anyway. Or they would have just been on the other side, should the storm have continued anyway. He was not stressed out at all. So here we find so many times that we are living in unnecessary stress and we bring harm over ourselves because of a lack of trust. That does not... Um, change God's action towards us. He's faithful to us even before we believed in him. He gave his son while we were sinners. He's just talking about a quality of life that I'm talking about a quality of life that God has for us. Now, back to what Paul is saying here and the scripture here in verse 10. It says that he gave Jesus and Paul was to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. We as Christians we can minister the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, if you don't do that, and you're always worried and stressed, I mean, I don't say we cannot have a normal conversation when we have a barbecue, just about normal life. That can be there. Yet, I also believe that even without talking about Jesus, we can have a very positive outlook on the world and the future. Today is much better than ever in history, man. I've just mentioned to you on how you were to worship other gods in the time of Jesus and prior to Jesus, in the time of, of, of a lot of these heathen, heathens believing in these false gods, sacrificing children, all of that. That is definitely not the way things go generally in the world today we find the effect of the resurrected Christ and we can rest. We can rest. Has God been faithful until now? Yes. What's going to change? Nothing. He's going to remain faithful. I preach that always on the New Year's messages. One thing you can expect is that the God of last year will be the same God of the next year, in the, which is the same God that gave his son. Amen. The intent on why this good news is preached is this. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Heavenly realms here does not refer to uh, demons. It refers to political leaders. So what he's saying is, is that we are, as the church, through the life that Jesus effortlessly bring forth in our lives, be uh, uh, basically a news report, a good news report to other authorities, where it is said that Jesus is Lord over these people's lives. He's brought them peace, peace in the midst of turmoil. He's brought loving kindness to them. He's brought the fruit of the Spirit to them. They live as people that have the hope of eternal life. So the intent was that through us, unto powers and principalities, unto, in, the, in Paul's day, the, the, the Caesar, all the centurions, the leaders of the synagogues and the leaders of the temple and all those people, that to them may be made known. Even through the Gentiles, it might be made known the dimensions of the love of God. So, we as the church cannot define being informed by having knowledge of the things of the world. We are God's information that the world lacks. 
We all know that there's corruption out there. We all know that people lie. We all know that people are in it for themselves. We all know that. That is common knowledge. I think, and this is just my opinion, is that we, we can so easily, or a, a human being is the right word here, can so easily be addicted to negative news because, like I mentioned, every time it releases something in you and it gives you a fix to the point that you all the time need to hear something negative, which is not God's quality of life for you. Neither am I even proposing that you should try and get rid of that by yourself. It is not possible. It's something you get saved from. It's something you get delivered from by the resurrected Jesus, by his goodness, as you are just willing for him to bring that forth in your life. Can we talk about negative things? Yes, I do see Paul talking about negative things. I do see Jesus talk about negative things. But he is preaching the positive. And that is when you look at the Bible, you look at the, the idea that you get when you read it is the love of God for humanity. That is the focus, not negativity. Look what these people have done again. Look what those have done. No, 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 it is. Look at what God has done again. He has healed somebody. He has brought peace. He's raised Christ from the dead. He's given us hope. So, here it says that his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to rulers and authorities. So, God has got a wisdom. Jesus Christ became the wisdom of God unto us. So, we're not becoming wise <laughs> by hearing about what bad thing people are doing again. No, we are becoming wise by having knowledge of what God has done in Christ. That is wisdom. That is wisdom. The Bible says that through Jesus Christ, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. All you ever need is found in the fact that Jesus died for you, he rose again, and that is from where you find your life. If you study at the university, obviously you're going to have other knowledge. You're going to have knowledge about your the, the subject and that. I'm not saying you cannot have knowledge about that, but the wisdom you need in how to live in this world, or I wouldn't even say how to, from which you live, is Jesus, man. That is the focus. That is what our kids need to hear. That is what we need to hear on a daily basis.